let's do this one now. When I'm going to do a below, a below knee case, I think this one uh, will show you a different uh, scenario. <clears throat> so we have a 75-year-old obese man with pain, gangrene, and MRSA infection in the right foot, which really worsened over the course of several months. He has the classic risk factors and also has has undergone a prior cabbage and has a pacemaker. And this is how he presented to his podiatrist. So he showed up like this, had some type of surgery on the great toe over here, you know, that was done a long time ago, which uh, he didn't remember exactly what they did or, or why, but basically he had that deformity. And you can see this is definitely a foot with really bad disease. But the podiatrist did this went ahead and did a TMA right away because he had osteomyelitis in addition to having that cellulitis and, MRSA, and associated MRSA infection. And so I didn't see the patient until uh, the TMA was already done. So the podiatrist did the TMA and then two weeks later, then he started looking like this. So you can see now this wound is breaking down and he's developing gangrene and and, and uh, now we're, we're the patient's at risk for really a BKA or an AKA or, or something, depending on what's going on with him. And this is really where I saw the patient. So I did my normal thing, right? Did my good physical exam. I did non-invasive testing. And you can see that, again, there's no augmentation from thigh to calf. So we know that there's some level of fempop disease here. And uh, the status, I knew there's some level of below knee disease, but I didn't know how bad it was because we have a little bit of a dampened waveform. His ABI is 0. 0.6. And so you could make the argument, well, why don't we do a, a CTA here? And you could, you could do a CTA or you could do a duplex ultrasound or an MRA. Just take your pick and see what works for you in your lab. The other thing I did is I did something that's called a TCOM or a transcutaneous oxygen measurement. You know, a TCOM basically tells you what the oxygen, oxygen level is in the tissues, and it's great for wounds. Now, it's a little bit controversial because some, uh, some uh, uh, CLI physicians say that, well, you know, there's the absolute values, you know, what does it mean and so forth. But the way we use it is we like to use it because we have a pre- and then if we do a post after revascularization, it gives us some idea of if we made a difference. So for us, that's the way we use it. And so I have kind of my internal reference, which is I'm doing it first. For those that don't know what it is, they do a baseline electrode here, and that gives you your baseline oxygen level in the tissues. Then basically they put electrodes at different places in the foot to see what it looks like. And so you can see that he had a right TMA and they put these here. And when you look at these values, anything under really seven, 50 to 70 is completely abnormal. And you can see he's dealing with 9, 4, 30, 19, and 30, not great levels. So just leaving it as is, that's not going to heal. And clinically, we know it's not going to heal because after two weeks, he started having woundy hisses. So now I have that, I have to decide what I'm going to do. And so in, in, in our case, we go straight to angiography. So again, I knew that the common femoral repulses were normal. There's no inflow disease. So basically went um, anagrade in this case, because I knew that when I looked with ultrasound on the table, that most of the proximal SFA was normal. I had enough room to put in a sheath and a guide wire and so forth. You can go up and over from the opposite groin if you want as well. That's really operator dependent. I tend to do a lot of anti-grade sticks, so I feel pretty comfortable with it. And you can see that we did the angiogram. We've got a little bit of a disease distal SFA. We got, a, we got an SFA occlusion, and there it is. And when you look at the caps, you can see that these are really, it's kind of a tough, it can be a tough recam because you got this bulbous thing here. You're not really sure where to start your recanalization. You have this large collateral. You have a more favorable cap here if you're going to do retrograde. He happened to already have been stented here in the past. I don't know when. And so, you know, our thought is, okay, what do we do now? Well, like I said, I always start anagrade. And so that's what I did. Again, I have a CXI CTO catheter. I have a Command 18 guide wire. You can use a V18. You can use an 035 catheter. You can use a regular glide wire like some operators do. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. And then the recanalization was actually pretty uneventful, to be honest with you. I didn't think we would get through this as easily or quickly as we did. So we crossed it. We got distally. So now I did my runoff because we were not able to get good pictures because of that occlusion to start. And you can see that he has a pretty robust and widely patent posterior tibial artery. 
But look how long it's taking for contrast to get there. It's pretty slow. So you can imagine that to heal a TMA, which is over here, if you look at this lateral view, look at how long it's taking this contrast. And it's not even opacifying this area. Plus, he doesn't have an anterior tibial or DP, doesn't have an intact plantar loop or pedal arch. And so healing this at this point is going to be very tough. So we know we got to do some level of intervention. So like I said, we crossed pretty uneventfully. And so now the question is, you know, what type of vessel prep are we going to do? Is it with a uh, scoring balloon? Are we going to do atherectomy? Um, that's one decision tree. The second one is, are we going to do angioplasty, drug-coated balloon, bare metal stent, drug-eluting stent, covered stent, etc.? I think most people would not do angioplasty alone because the data is pretty clear that the patency rate at one year is really about quarter, 25, maybe 30%, pretty low. We know that um, DCB has good patency rate at one year for sure, assuming that we can uh, um, um, get a good result uh, angiographically without recoil. So we'll know that after we do our initial angioplasty. We know that bare metal stents have some uh, good data at one year for sure. Drug eluting stent is good. Cover stent is good if you have good um, uh, runoff, but then the cost goes up, right? These are all more expensive, right? Drug eluting stents, cover stents, and drug coated balloons cost more. And so we have to decide what we're going to do. So in our lab, we basically did atherectomy in this case. We did angioplasty. There was recoil. So I went ahead and put in drug eluting stents because I wanted to optimize this patient because we really need to get healing. This is a CLI patient. So we did that. And we had a pretty nice result. <clears throat> post-angioplasty, you can see that this popliteal, this P3 segment here is, is narrowed and a little bit diseased, especially here where my guide wire is. So we did this, and then we were going to run off the leg, and then, of course, you know, you're out of contrast, so the tech's like, oh, hold on, I have to reload. And while we were waiting, my fellow and I, the patient started saying, you know, doc, my foot is starting to feel numb, and it's kind of hurting a little bit. So now we're like, oh, well, it looked, I mean, I, did we embolize distally? What happened? So we decided to do another run of the dist of our area that we did, and this is what we found. So now we have this, and so now you have to think to yourself, oh, brother, now what am I dealing with, right? This looked fine a minute ago, even though it was diseased, and we had pretty good outflow, but now we have sluggish flow, and we have this, and so we have to think to ourselves, okay, what's the ideology? Is this debris from my recan, my stenting, my angioplasty, my atherectomy? I doubt it that it's embolic, mainly because we did that initial angiogram, it looked okay. Is this a dissection? Is there clot there? Do I have both? So my thought process was, well, I'm not sure... I thought probably, if anything, it could be a dissection. Maybe it's, it's something like that. I gave two milligrams of TPA directly into this artery there. And then basically I knew that I had to cross it. And then when I look back in hindsight, see this loop here? I think this loop had lifted up a plaque. And so that's ultimately probably what narrowed that diseased artery. It was already diseased as it was. You can see that even any minor guide wire manipulations in diseased vessels can cause trouble. So you want to use really good technique for this. So I figured the ideology was maybe this guide wire. I knew that at this point we have to recan this and open it up. And you can see how much pressure I'm pushing with this catheter and this wire to get through I knew the posterior tibial artery was the dominant blood vessel going to the foot, as we saw, right? So that was my ultimate uh, idea was I got to recanalize this regardless of what it has to be done. I need to open up the posterior tibial artery because that's what we want to save. Otherwise, this patient's going to get an, uh, an AKA uh, at this point, and we haven't helped them. So we got through, as you saw. And if you want to know what I used here, basically, <clears throat> is I basically used... Uh, a CTO catheter, and I used a regular glide wire, basically. Nothing fancy here. And I, and I basically just did a roadmap or a floral fade, whatever you use, and I basically just recanalized it and then got into that vessel. And it felt like a dissection. I did an angiogram distally, and there was no debris, no, nothing embolic. So then I said, all right, that fits with what, what we thought, probably a little dissection or a little flap. And after I got through, I did another angiogram. Angiogram, and this is what it looked like. You can see basically at two points, there's a 
probably a dissection there and we have a spiral dissection here. So now you have to think to yourself, all right, what do I have to do here? Do I want to stent, not stent? Is there something else I can do? Well, most dissections, what's the first thing you can do? You can do a prolonged angioplasty. So I did a prolonged angioplasty. It looked good after the prolonged angioplasty at this top site here. And then I did a drug coated balloon there. So that way I didn't have to stent and I left that alone. But prolonged angioplasty for the TP trunk extending into that proximal posterior tibial artery, it looked like this, no different. So then you think to yourself, all right, well, what am I going to do here? And so prolonged angioplasty looked the same. So you could say to yourself, well, let me DCB this and hope that it heals. Is it flow limiting? Is it not flow limiting? I think those are all great thoughts. But remember, I have a lot of angiograms I could show where I have non-flow limiting dissections. And then when we look with IVIS, you've got almost 80, 90% stenosis. It's just that you don't see it well <coughs> angiographically. So in this case, we got to keep his lifeline intact. And so I decided to use a drug eluting stent in this case making sure I don't cover this anterior tubular artery origin. Uh, I knew I'd cover the perineal, but remember, this is really the dominant vessel to his foot. And so I put in a drug eluting stent, has good data in the proximal tibials. And then after ballooning it, you can see the difference in flow. Here's that pop segment over here that we treated. You can see the AT origin is open. Even though it occludes here, I wanted to keep it open for future therapy if I need to come back, you can see there's much better flow to the foot. The PT is intact. Here's a pre and post. And look at how long pre before fixing it takes to get to the foot. Here you can see it's much more brisk flow on the right side. You can see there's a nice angiographic wound blush right here. And there's much better flow to the foot. Here's the pre and the post basically. I mean, well, this is the post. The final showing you better flow to the foot, some good communicating branches, filling. You've got a nice angiographic wound blush. These are all kind of positive things you, you look for when you're talking about CLI endpoints on the table. Brisk flow, vessel is open, no residual stenosis, angiographic wound blush. Those are all the things you're looking for, as we all know. We did our non-invasive testing. You can see now everything looks good. ABI is 0.9 from 0.6. And you can see that the TCOM now, if you look, not perfect, but much better. So again, that's why it's a little bit controversial. You could say, well, these aren't the, the normal that they talk about is above 50, definitely above 70. Well, that doesn't meet that. But we know we did make an improvement angiographically by non-invasive testing I just showed you. The next part is the clinical exam. This is what it looked like. And you can see that with good wound care by our podiatry team that we got we got wound healing in this case. <clears throat> so thank, thank you. And uh, hopefully uh, I didn't do too much talking and confuse you. It's uh, it just seems like there's always a lot of information to give when I'm showing these cases and more and more stuff comes up, but uh, hopefully you got something out of